Good evening. It's October 4th, 2013. My name is Matthew Ogden, and I would like to welcome all of you to our weekly broadcast of the LaRouche Pack uh, Friday night webcast. As you know, if you've been watching our broadcasts, uh, we do these on a weekly basis, and we feature Mr. Lyndon LaRouche. Uh, and the format is a series of questions which Mr. LaRouche is given the opportunity to respond to. Joining me in the studio tonight is Benjamin Denniston, a leader of our basement scientific research team. Uh, he will be joining me in posing a series of questions. Now, I would like to start with a significant question, which has come in from a source in Washington. And the questioner asks the following. Mr. LaRouche, you have issued a statement this week addressing the deeper economic and financial collapse process and the urgent need to pass Glass-Steagall now. This is in the context of the still ongoing government shutdown, the looming showdown over the debt ceiling, and the fight over Obamacare. You were a harsh critic of Obamacare from the outset. Can you please provide us with your assessment of the actual economic and financial crisis that most members of Congress and the administration are avoiding? What is the real magnitude of the problem, and what are the real solutions? Well, I'm going to do, say something in terms that will be regarded as shocking, but it's necessary to do so in order to tell the truth. If you try to say polite things, about this situation. You're, you're going to be a liar whether you intend to be so or not. What, the, what has happened to the United States right now is the culmination of a process which has reached a point of absolute breakdown, that where everything will tend to break down. And it could break down at any point. For example, you, ha you, had a, you have social effects in a condition like this. Now, we had a few incidents, shooting incidents and similar kinds of things that happened immediately after the shutdown started. What this represented was not people going freaked out. It meant the, the instability of the entire social process you know, that, that had entered. Yeah, you no longer have a system that is rational in any sense. And there's nothing about what either the Republicans are doing or even worse, what Obama is doing in this connection. This, there is no solution for the situation in which Obama and the Republicans have put, the, put this situation. No possible solution. This is absolutely insane. And if they try to even get through what Obama's trying to get through, it will cause the greatest increase of death rates in the, among the American people you ever heard of. So the, prob the problem is that when the repeal of Glass-Steagall occurred uh, before the Obama, uh, before the Bush administration, young Bush, that from that point on, there has been a, a continual uh, collapse of the U.S. economy. What you have is Wall Street, but Wall Street is not really an economy. It's a disease. It, there is no, there's no particular benefit in this process. It's a sickness, a disorder, and it's a fraud against the people. Now what happens, two things happen. You have the uh, cancellation of Glass-Steagall. That started the process. Then we had the 9-11 operation. That accelerated the process, a breakdown process. And that accelerated a rate, an increasing rate of inflation in the process. And this has begun soaring out of control. Now, people don't realize by looking at the government figures on, for, uh, for, on this purpose. They don't mean anything because what's happening, you're having a collapse of actual production, which means that we are losing our level of production. At the same time, we're having an inflation of what is not production, but just plain money speculation. In other words, it becomes a Wall Street-oriented operation with no regard. Uh, the shutting down of the auto industry was the most signal part of this physical breakdown of the economy. Now, what's happened more recently, 
the standard of living of ordinary working people in their professions, and whatever, whatever the trade is, is they are falling way behind. In other words, they are much poorer while working. Also, at the same time, of the total population of the United States, the employable population in particular, their, their collapse is catastrophic because we no longer have the productive powers of labor. We no longer have the employed skills which have the same value. So your skill level per capita has collapsed not just the, the total amount of employment, but the skill level, the net skill level. So now we come to a point where Obama's come up with the dirtiest squindle of, all, of them all. What he's doing is he is about to unleash what's called bail-in. If, if you let him do that, if you let him go with his Obamacare swindle, and it's a pure swindle, there's no truth in it. Obama's with the biggest liar of the United States right now. Well, what that means is we've come into a time where once he puts that into place, his Obamacare, first of all, most people will not be qualified for, for help under Obamacare. People are going to die through this action of Obama's pro, that health, uh, pro, Obamacare. We have leaders in the Senate who are as guilty as hell in backing up Obama on this thing. Because were the thing to go into effect, you're going to have an accelerating rate of deaths among people who would no longer have the means to, for exi to exist, and no, no longer have any real health care. This is a murderous swindle by Obama or the people who are pushing him. So th these lead to a lot of complications. First of all, be because we became a post-industrial society, with freakish elements added into that, the United States is now headed toward doom, to a breakdown. And what you have is the panic you saw in two cases on the streets in, in Washington, and the other reflections of the same kind of panic. This is not a panic. This is not some, the problem is not that the panic occurred. The problem is that the panic is a symptom of the horrible thing that is occurring. And you have to look at these things in this way. Uh, the, prob the other problem is because we are no longer an industrial power, we killed off most of our industrial power. We were once on the way, in the 1970s, we were on the way to a major uh, f physical uh, operation, a major production, thermal fusion. We were on the road then, and I was part of an organization then at that time, the Fusion Energy Foundation. And the cap what we had as, as principles qualified for that. As we went along, we began to get more and more, because of the idea of the space program, we got more and more of how to do this. But then you find automatically you could never do it. People could play around with fusion, but they were not allowed to actually apply it in the way it was intended to be developed and used. So what we've been doing, the United States per capita is collapsing. The incomes of our people are collapsing. The rate of un unemployment is collapsing. And Wall Street is the principal criminal. Because Wall Street and Wall Street being turned loose, then with Bush, young Bush, with 9-11, and what's followed with Obama has been the greatest catastrophe for the United States in modern times. And if we allow Obama to continue to do what he does now, then we will, bail in will come in and the death rate in the United States among our people will be un unbelievable. So therefore, Obama must be thrown out of office what he's doing is treasonous in effect. Whatever he intends to do, his actions are treasonous because they go to the very existence of the United States. We no longer will exist as a nation. What he's doing is the highest form of treason. It's not treason against the nation. It's treason in the form of destroying the nation. Now, the alternative is what's important. 
we have to sort of re-educate a lot of people who lost the skills of understanding how an economy works. Now, in fact, I can say from my expertise that only a very small percentile of the population who are supposed to be economists or people like that, only a very small percentile have any real competence. I, I probably know of them or know them personally. Huh? They are competent in what they do. Uh, I, I'm involved in a different level right, in this stuff. But the point is, we've reached a point that if we sit back and allow Obama to continue this swindle, and it is a pure swindle and a mass, mass murderous one, because once the bail-in program is put in, the intention is first, get the health care, Obamacare in first, then come in with bail-in. This is the nightmare of, of Wall Street. Hmm? If that comes in, then you're going to get general mass death among people who are not qualified to be given the opportunity to have health care. They'll be off the health care list. Then with bail-in, the rate at which the collapse of these values occur will accelerate. And you will have mass murder in the United States, conforming to what the British Queen wants us to, wants us to do. And that's it. So we're now, fa we're now faced in a case that anybody who's still voting for Obama and backing Obama is either criminal or insane. Well, let me ask a follow-up question on exactly what you just said. And to get a little bit more to the substance of what you've been referring to as a general breakdown crisis. Um, as you know, while the government has been shut down, Obama chose to meet with none other than the top CEOs from the big six Wall Street banks in the White House, including Jamie Dimon from J.P. Morgan and Lloyd Blankfein of Goldman Sachs. And while this meeting was called to ostensibly discuss the debt ceiling, we know that the two foremost issues on Wall Street's mind are, number one, their utter fear and loathing of Glass-Steagall, and the fight that we are leading on this, uh, on Glass-Steagall. And number two, their insatiable addiction to quantitative easing bailout funds. And uh, last week, you commissioned a leaflet uh, to expose the truth about this hyperinflation in the price of basic goods that Americans depend upon um, since the repeal of Glass-Steagall and since 9-11. And uh, this is the product of that. Wall Street is out to kill you with hyperinflation. And you can see the charts that we put together. Our research showed that since September 11th, Americans have seen prices of the basic goods needed to sustain human life double, if not more, while their incomes have been collapsing. That is, if you're not in the upper 1%. And you made the point at that time that it's necessary for the American people to recognize that the suffering that they've experienced is not unique to them. They're not isolated in this suffering, uh, but in fact, they are experiencing a, con a, a condition that practically the entire American population is experiencing as well. And only by doing this can you objectify the crisis and coalesce the type of solidarity that's necessary to unify the population and moralize them enough to fight. Now, on the question of a general breakdown crisis, as you've made the point, this is not just a depression. You're dealing with a scientifically defined idea of a general breakdown crisis, where there exists no solution within the parameters of the current system. Uh, and I think the debate over QE is an example of that. It's whether you accelerate or taper, it's a true damned if you do, damned if you don't. On one hand, you're going to have sudden hyperinflationary explosion. On the other hand, you'll have an implosion of the entire system. And it's only by introducing a factor from outside those parameters that you can possibly solve the crisis. And as you've said, that factor is Glass-Steagall accompanied by Hamiltonian credit. So I'd like to 
ask you to address these two topics a little bit more. One, the necessity of creating the sense of shared solidarity among the American people to moralize them enough to fight. And number two, to elaborate a little bit more on this scientifically precise idea of a general breakdown crisis per se. We've got a complicated process here because on the one hand, you've got the people generally know they're being swindled, but they don't want to say so. They're afraid of reprisals against them. Now, in many of the crimes which have been committed against the United States government and against our constitutions, that's been the problem. That it, we have more and more of the population is terrified. And therefore, they will not squawk. They will not resist. And when people walk over them, they hate it, but they're afraid to say so. And so this is the, this is the key problem we, we have to deal with. What we, what we need is you need fighters, and it's not fighters in terms of street fighters, but it's fighters in terms of the mind. You need people who will actually say this is a fraud. The evidence is there. Well, what they will do, they'll say, that's over the top, that's over the top. And when you hear somebody saying, that's over the top, you know they're a freak. They've just gone wild. They are no longer have their minds pulled together. But it, you see that phenomenon out there. And when somebody says it's over the top, you know he's crazy. And dangerously so. Because they become violent. And the characteristic is, the, that's over the top becomes a violent expression. That means they know that they're lying but they know they'd better lie, otherwise somebody will take it out on them. And if you take the number of assassinations and things like that that have occurred in the United States increasingly over the, this period of time, say 9-11, the cover-up of 9-11, these things are crimes. You know, you had the British Empire you know, with its institutions and the Saudi the guy who was uh, at that time was the Saudi representative, ambassador to the United States. And he was involved directly in 9-11. The whole operation was 9-11, was, was that. So as a result of this process, our people are more and more frightened. And they will say, they show their fear in violent expressions. Like what happened on this case, you had a couple of people caught in a police fire, crossfire. And that's fear, that leads to fear, and fear causes it. But the problem is that this juggernaut, which is being pushed by Obama and by his British masters, hmm? this is the thing that's terrifying the population. And this is where the issue where we need with ourselves to make clear what this whole thing is. And there are two things. First of all, if you talk about monetarism, if you talk about monetarist assumptions, anybody who espouses monetarism or monetarist standards so-called financial standards, which are monetary standards, they are incompetent and should be sought, recognized as that and simply say they are incompetent. What Obama is pushing is fraudulently incompetent. He's a fraud and he's incompetent and he's a liar. So therefore the problem is we must, the mission, you've got to do something about this. The mission is we've got to put the power over the United States government in the hands of the people of the United States and by the kinds of people who are real leaders in the United States who can exert the kind of leadership necessary to give confidence to the other people in, the, in our, our population. Look, they, they've been stripped of everything. Since the uh, cancellation of, of uh, Glass-Steagall, they've been stripped of everything. Their jobs, there are no longer any real jobs in the United States. There are no industrial jobs in the United States to speak of. A few handfuls of those sprinkling. People don't have a job. They don't have the income to maintain themselves as they were. They, they're poor compared to their parents and so forth. So therefore, we, we face a point where we have to provide confidence and leadership. Don't be afraid to tell the truth. And that's what's wrong with most of our people. 
they may smell the truth, but they don't want to know they can even smell it because they are afraid of what might happen to them if they indicate that they are being dissident. That's a problem. Now, I particularly know more about economics than probably any of the Republican Party <laughs> or the Democratic Party, for that matter. But, and we, there are solutions for this thing. Go back to our principal, Glass-Steagall. And, but understand, this time, really understand Glass-Steagall. Under Glass-Steagall, just, we just do Glass-Steagall, put it through now, and put it through not as a money system, but as a credit system. There's been, people have tried to use it as a money system. Bill Clinton, for example, tried to use it as a money system. It has to be used as a credit system. And people don't know what a credit system is. So that's something we're going to have to worry about. All right, Lynn, we have a question shifting across the Pacific here. Um, this comes from a Beijing-based scholar who has been following your work for many years now. And he is, for various obvious reasons, quite anxious to get your response and is concerned about the consequences of the issues he's raising in his question. So he says, Mr. LaRouche, China has made, it, has made Shanghai a free trade zone. This is the first experimental stage for eventual liber liberalization of the Chinese economy, a liberalization which I believe carries certain risks. This will be a main topic at the upcoming session of the party leadership this November. It's being done now in response to the fact that most Asian nations have uh, indicated a willingness to join Washington's Trans-Pacific Part Partnership, the TPP, which was specifically directed against China. So while China is not formally excluded from the TPP, entry would require a much greater liberalization of the Chinese economy. But at the same time, being left out of the TPP could also have serious repercussions on the Chinese economy. So what then are the dangers China incurs by further liberalization of China's economy? And what can China do to avoid this dilemma? There is no way by accommodation to that liberalization conception, which would not lead to the destruction of the nation of China at a very rapid rate. It would, but let's look at the reality of the situation, because what, the, what he describes is the usual view shared among nations and among cowardly nations in particular. I mean, look what happened in Japan. They c canceled all nuclear power. Now, that probably will not stick, but a certain faction in Japan did ram that through. And that doing that will destroy Japan. That is, that is continuing to ban thermo a nuclear power in Japan will cause the collapse of Japan because there's no substitute available for it. Inherently, nuclear power is inherently far more efficient than any other form of power being used in the world today. Thermonuclear fusion takes us into a completely different dimension. Now, with a now China's problem is, in part, that Europe is collapsing. The nations of Europe are about to die. And I mean die. Germany is one of the last holdups. Look what happened in all these nations in the Euro system. They're all dying. And there's nothing in process that's going to stop them from dying except canceling that euro system and going back to a, actually a credit system, not a, not a monitor system. Now, what's needed in China, China has lived to a certain point. It's coming to a point where things are bad. For a while, China was left alone, a little, pretty much left alone from Washington and Britain and so forth. But that was a temporary arrangement. Now, what happened is China got the production, uh, means of production, of automobiles and so forth there. That was a temporary arrangement. The next step of this thing from now, the, it's going to go in the opposite direction. They're going to try to shut down China. And if China goes with a liberal program, China will be destroyed. 
the, actually the only solution now on the planet as a whole is to use thermonuclear fusion as a, we, we can't get it fully in, installed as a going economic tool right now. But we have to go through a process of activating thermonuclear fusion, which may take uh, several years to even begin to get where we have to get. But we, it, it's feasible. There's nothing about, you don't have to prove it can happen. It will work. But the problem is to get the skills and the machinery and so forth and the experimental work done to do it. So we have to say now, to, and China too, because we have, Europe is hopeless right now. Europe has no possibility of actually being a going economy. None. It's gone. Russia probably is one of the most uh, likely success cases in Europe. And it's in trouble. So, but the problem now, and that's been shown, the problem now is that we, we cannot, in a bankrupted United States, which is what it's done, since young Bush came into the presidency, the United States has been on the way to hell. And it's been getting worse all the time. And Obama is the very worst thing we've seen so far. Anybody who says they like Obama, they must be insane. <laughs> so therefore, the point is, our objective must be, in particularly with respect to China, China is the most important reference point right now economically for the United States. But the, it has to be a United States which is going back to Glass-Steagall. So now what we're going to do is go to high technology. Anything that's going to work is going to be relatively high technology. A lot of the China labor force has been working as cheap labor, according to routine jobs, where they can do the work, put the parts together and so forth, but they're not really generating within among themselves the driver program for mass production or mass development. So that has to reverse because when Europe goes to the final collapse and the U.S. goes to its collapse, what is China going to do? Who's it going to ex export to? There are no export partners under the way trends are going now. So therefore, what we have to do is we have to do this one thing that any competent economist does. I admit there are very few competent economists on this planet now. We used to have a higher ration of these types. It means we have to go to a, pro a higher energy flux density program. It means that the, we have to do that on the basis of taking our target goal, thermonuclear fusion. That is the only chance for this planet. And what we've gone through already, just in the basement, our base program, we've gone through the evidence. We have enough knowledge of what can be done that we can, are now situated to know that we could. We're going to have to learn a lot of things in the process, but we know what the technology is. This technology, if applied, will bring us to the greatest leap forward in the history of the human species. And China can be a, pil a pilgrim in that process because China needs it because it no longer has a European market that's worth anything. It has only a poor U U.S. market. It's, it's depending upon. So therefore, if China is, and China is uh, capable of becoming the uh, keystone of a revival of the planet, and we're talking about going from the Mississippi River westward into the Pacific Ocean up to the uh, Arctic, and down through deep into Asia. And China becomes then a, a, a fulcrum in the whole process. And what we need to do is realize that, that China can no longer live on the trading partners it's had in Europe and so forth, or even in the United States the way it's been functioning. But we do know that China is now ready with the right backing to actually become the fulcrum of a trans-Pacific region which we would look at you know, from the Arctic in general, we would look at it from the west of the Mississippi, on, across the Pacific, and deep into Asia. That's, in those nations that are comprised in that particular area, they are the hope of rebuilding or starting a rebuilding and going higher of the world as a whole, the planet as a whole. This is what we must do. All this stuff they're talking about 
is doomed. And people will say, well, it works. It doesn't work. It has not worked. So we have a follow-up on this theme of the shifting currents internationally and the shifting geopolitical situation. Um, as you know, Lynn, the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu was in Washington this week following his speech at the United Nations, and he is desperately attempting to sabotage the uh, potentials for progress being made with the P5 plus one talks over the di diplomacy with Iran. However, it's clear that the Middle East war faction is in a weakening position uh, due to the intervention largely that Russia made to force a peaceful revolution resolution of the Syrian chemical weapons affair, uh, along with the central role that Russia is now playing with regards to war avoidance with Iran in particular. Now, as you stated earlier today, Russians, Russia's actions have not only been crucial in transforming the strategic geometry of the area of the greater Southwest Asian region, but Russia's economic reorientation towards the East and towards Southwest Asia represent a significant factor in geopolitics at the present time. We know that recently Putin signed several agreements with the president of Vietnam to develop nuclear power plants in that country. Uh, this past Wednesday, Sergei Kirinenko ad attended the groundbreaking ceremony for the first nuclear power plant being built in Bangladesh. Russia is underwriting 90% of the cost of this project and has agreed to train the workers uh, to run the nuclear power plant. And incidentally, also today, Russia announced the launching of a feasibility study to develop a manned base on the moon. So if you take the recent actions which Russia has taken, together with the announcement at the SCO meeting of the new Chinese president to go ahead with the Eurasian land bridge idea by name, it becomes very clear that the world is in the midst of an epic geopolitical realignment. Can you comment on this global perspective? We have to th think differently than we have before on this planet. We, because what's happened to us, the, the, uh, with the death of Franklin Roosevelt and the advent of Truman, we, the United States, which had the promise of becoming the great nation that it had been promised to be before. But the death of, of him, the death of, uh, caught, allowed a bum to become the president of the United States, and a bum who was completely controlled by Churchill and the British interests. Mm. We never really recovered. We have one recovery, <laughs> and he was assassinated. And since the assassination of him, We've never, we have always been on the road down. Now that was the purpose of this whole thing. What had happened is Churchill had called for uh, President, Cl uh, <laughs> President to uh, join in defending uh, Europe against Hitler. And uh, that had worked. Uh, actually, Truman got the better of it in the end because he was... I mean, uh, because he was a, a stooge of the British. Then we had a fight, and we had another president who was capable, and he did well, and then he was assassinated. And for that assassination, the United States has been sliding downward in net course all the way through. Look what happened immediately after the killing of our president. What happened is we went, we took a bunch of American citizens to, into a war which there was no good reason to go into. As Douglas MacArthur, who died in that period right after uh, that, and we never, we never really regained. We had the programs in place which had been set into motion, mm -hmm. but these programs were dwarfed by what was happening and the changes in the government. There were people in government who tried to get it back. But the Bush family, for example, was one of the people from the inside 
who is always working for the British, destroying the chances of the United States to recover. Once that death had occurred, the United States never had any net progress, real progress. So what we're at now, we're in a situation where we now have to have progress, and we can. But the impediments are such things as this particular present president and some of the Republicans and others. The, the American people have lost a sense of the, their own confidence in their ability to do things which years earlier or decades earlier they would have understood could be done. What The problem that we face, me for example, is that we know what to, what to do. We know what will work. But can we induce our fellow citizens to accept what can work? This has been all the way along. We've always had these opportunities, great opportunities. Take Semilukia Fusion. Since the 1970s, Semilukia Fusion has been a, a feasible project. And what it means, it means a gigantic leaps for mankind. It means that mankind will be able to manage itself within the solar system when you get into those times of technology. Thermonuclear fusion has that implication. We're not going to put people on Mars, but we're going to put things on Mars which we will control with the aid of Earth. And these things will give us the means to defend ourselves against big rocks which, if they hit the Earth, will wipe out the human population of the Earth. So we will have these kinds of capabilities. Once we have that, and we have the world in the hands of governments. Now, this we have a new way. The other aspect of this is without thermonuclear fusion, you cannot defend the planet Earth and its population from a large satellite asteroid. asteroid. One blow from a big asteroid, which is lay, lurking nearby in the environment, and the human species is extinct. So therefore, we have missions in this area to organize ourselves on planet Earth to the defense of Earth as necessary and to do other things in, in dealing with the part of the universe which we inhabit. And that should be, and thermonuclear fusion brings us into that area. And the next thing comes matter antimatter, which is Einstein's baby. So we, the, we have to have a our perspective, and we always need a perspective. Where should mankind go next? We have to be, a, a, what we are inherently, a creative species. Therefore, we have to be looking always to the future, not to the past, but to the future. And in that way, we understand our proper destiny. There's a lot more to this than I've said, but essentially that's the essential point. We need, mankind will not be able to secure mankind himself, unless we now turn with the skills we have and the skills which are accessible for us to develop, to be able to muster an adequate defense of planet Earth and its people and to use the moon as an, a special instrument for conveniently launching materials from, the, from Earth's surface into the moon. Because if you try to, if you have to pump all that distance and go up, up, up to the moon every time you take a trip, it's very wasteful. So what you better do is, is build a, an ap apparatus on the moon, underneath the surface, and where you will build and assemble things which you are going to use for work in space. And that should be the destiny which we work toward now. To, and to go into, the, into space, not to dwell there, but to realize what we have to do there on behalf of planet Earth. And if we take that orientation, we, thermonuclear fusion gives us a stepping stone toward higher forms of productivity, which can be reached then. What we need then is, again, not a practical program, because there are no practical problems out there. They're all incompetent. What we can do then is by getting control of these means of improvements, we can create the opportunities for mankind to do the kinds of things that mankind must do in the interests of mankind. Well, 
just to get directly at this question, um, as I'm sure most of our viewers now know, several weeks ago we released this special report titled Nuclear Nuwapa 21, Gateway to the Fusion Economy. And in the very first chapter of that report, we call for a Manhattan-style crash program to achieve fusion power. Now, interestingly, another report that was published just a few months ago was called to our attention today um, called Fusion Power a 10-year plan to energy security. And this was published by the American Security Project, which is an organization headed up by several significant individuals who are well known, including Norm Augustine, who was known as the head of the Augustine Commission on uh, Man and Space, and he's the former president and CEO of Lockheed Martin. Um, Gary Hart is on the board, former senator from Colorado, who was also a presidential candidate, and several significant retired generals, admirals, and other flag officers. So in this nearly 40-page report, the authors echo John F. Kennedy and call for an Apollo program by name to achieve fusion power within 10 years, obviously reminiscent of John F. Kennedy saying, we will have a man on the moon by the end of this decade. And they make a thorough review of all of the current status of fusion research, both domestically and internationally, both magnetic and inertial confinement. Um, and they stress that it was only because of budget cuts in the 1980s and 1990s that fusion research domestically has been stalled and we haven't made the crucial breakthrough on achieving a sustained fusion reaction. Um, what they emphasize is that achieving fusion power will completely revolutionize the U.S. economy, not only because it's an almost unlimited energy source, but also industries will be made possible by means of abundant fusion power, which are not possible now, including mass scale water desalination, fertilizer production, industrial applications of plasma technology, what we've referred to as the plasma torch, um, spin-offs such as superconductors, material development, small and large-scale ro robotics, and so on. But what they say is that the current timeline for fusion research development desperately needs to be accelerated or else we're going to lose the skills that we still have today and demoralize the next generation. And a national commitment must be made by the policy uh, makers of the United States. They, this is a quote from the report. They say, the main barrier to an aggressive plan to develop fusion energy is political will. And they warn, should we fail to adequately invest in fusion energy, we will not be able to train the next generation of scientific leaders or create the necessary industrial capacity. So um, what they say in the report, and I'm just going to outline this briefly, they make six recommendations to achieve this proposed accelerated timeline. Number one, a national fusion power commissioner should be appointed on the presidential level to coordinate and drive fusion research. Number two, a component test facility should be constructed for the efficient testing and development of new materials necessary to handle the extremely high temperature required for plasma confinement. Number three, multiple methodological pathways should be pursued simultaneously and in parallel, increasing the cross-fertilization of ideas and technology and allowing the necessary room for experimentation. Four, funding for fusion research at universities and national labs which are currently operating nowhere near full capacity, must be expanded to accelerate discovery and innovation. Uh, they stress fusion institutions need consistent funding and a base from which to build. Annual appropriations for fusion must be sufficient to avoid cuts. 
Innovation requires multi-year and often multi-decade planning and investment decisions. Fluctuating budgets with on-again, off-again funding is damaging to the scientific process. Five, they call for experimentation with alternative designs for fusion power plants, including modul modularization to standardize the reactor components to allow for mass production. And six, finally, the full incorporation of American industry into a fusion-driven economy. And so they conclude with this quote, which I think is significant. They say, just like when America committed itself to putting a man on the moon in the 1960s, America must rededicate itself to pushing the frontiers of science and engineering forward. America must commit to building a burning plasma facility within 10 years, and that will produce fusion energy. This will require $30 billion over that time frame and would require several support facilities to test materials and push the technology forward. Under this Apollo program, the six recommendations listed above are necessary to move quickly to the demonstration plant. So my question for you is, would you agree that this approach of an Apollo-style program, John F. Kennedy-style uh, leadership from the presidential level, directed from the top down, is the correct perspective to adopt if we're to achieve fusion power? Well, that's included. But there's something else which has to be included, too. Uh, we have made a mystique of science and engineering. And we have failed to see that classical artistic composition is not only an essential part of any such program, but that if you don't have that view, you won't succeed in your program. Because we, we, people you know, talk about mathematics, and they don't understand the limitations of mathematics conceptually. They don't understand the relationship of science to Shakespeare, huh? for example. And you do not understand Shakespeare unless you understand it as a scientific comprehension. I mean, I, I work with this all the time. I have fun with this. It's great fun. It's a great product. Most people don't even want to know about it. But this is the way it is. That we, we base ourselves too much on pragmatic constructions, and we think that mathematics, or mathematical physics as an improved form of mathematics, was, was adequate means to do so. It is not. Because the creative powers of the human mind are the real driver. It's not a, a specific skill which is known to exist or has been developed. That is not what drives man's progress. What drives man's progress is man understanding himself as he never understood mankind before. And when people don't, when people don't realize that rock music and other rubbish actually destroys the capability of the scientist to achieve these roles, and therefore it, it's an essential thing to create a cultural context. And it's not just to just be nice to, uh, uh, to you know, things like art. It's not the point. That the actual root of scientific creativity, as Einstein and Max Planck could have made it very emphatic to you, that it's, it's that relationship. It is not mathematics giving you physics which gives you progress. It gives you the creative powers of Nicholas of Cusa, in specific terms. Cusa's example and Kepler's follow-up on Cusa's work typifies what is the real source of science. So when people oversimplify science to make it a birth of mathematics, it is not. And the real greatest scientists were always were involved with classical music, classical artistic composition, and these kinds of things. Because without that basis, you don't have the competence to do the things you think in physics can do.
But let me ask one more question. Just a, I think, a good final question. Um, number one, let me let me back up a little bit and just say that there have been significant uh, cracks that are beginning to form in the British, Saudi, Anglo-Dutch empire um, concerning both the role of the Saudis in the events of the attacks leading up to 9-11, as well as their continued role in financing terrorism today. As you know, the continuing campaign to declassify the 28 pages is gaining significant traction among leading members of Congress. Um, we also saw this week a press release from an organization of families of the victims of 9-11 called 9-11 Families United to Bankrupt Terrorism, um, demanding that the FBI come clean on what it knew concerning the connections between Saudi Arabia and the 9-11 hijackers. And they quote former Senator Bob Graham saying, I am troubled by what appears to me to be a persistent effort by the FBI to conceal from the American people information concerning possible Saudi support of the September 11th attacks. And this initiative comes right on the heels of a bill that was filed last week by New York Congressman Peter King and New York Senator Chuck Schumer called the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act, or JASTA. Uh, which would close the foreign sovereign immunity loophole, which has been used up to this point to block various lawsuits that families have made against the Saudis concerning their role in financing the 9-11 attacks. Now, finally, during a hearing yesterday morning of the House Foreign Affairs Committee in the wake of the al-Shabaab attacks in Nairobi, Kenya, Congressman Mike McCall of Texas, who's also the chairman of the House Homeland Security Committee, stated that the time has come to address the inconvenient truth that the majority of terrorism worldwide is funded by Saudi Arabia. He said, quote, when you look at these organizations and you look at the funding streams, the majority of them are tied back to the Saudi Peninsula in terms of funding. This is the inconvenient truth no one talks about, and no one wants to deal with it either. This is something we're going to have to deal with at some point in time. And I know it's something with the Saudis being our ally that presents a problem. It's a challenge, but I think it is something that we need to address and see it for what it really is. So, Lynn, since you, for one, have been quite outspoken since the very days that the September 11th attacks occurred about the role of the Saudis in financing these attacks, I figured it would be appropriate to give you an opportunity to comment on these matters. <clears throat> the history of 9-11 starts from Britain, and Britain upgraded Saudi Arabia. We could have this large amount of money coming from oil revenues and use the Saudis, who are also bullies because of this, uh, this reason. And therefore, they hammered the whole Middle East area and across northern Africa and so forth. You want to say what the problems of, of Africa are? Well, one of the biggest problems are Saudis, the Saudi influence, because they move in, and this has been a rival to the Chinese. China is the only nation which ser seriously does anything for help to people in Africa. Not definitely part of Africa, but they have a, an extensive record on that thing. So the problem is is that the, the Saudi operation is a British Empire operation. What happened was that when Franklin Roosevelt died, what took over was Truman. And Truman was simply a stooge for the British. So you have this British-Saudi connection, and then you have this uh, arms function, which works between them. The entire Saudi operation against 9-11 in the United States is entirely British, in, because the British Empire, the British King Kingdom Empire, is its real source. It was they using Saudi oil, which they controlled, and producing weapons through the BAE operation that cr created the instruments which hit New York City in 
This is the authorship. Then you have Bush family. How do you think the Saudis who were in the United States, Saudi families, were in the United States at that time? Huh? And they were all over the place, especially Texas and especially as guests of the, of the Bush family. Huh? And what happened is a special arrangement. Now you have young Bush is now the president of the United States. He's a fool, but he's the president of the United States. And he has care team takers who d instruct him to all pull his, pull his uh, noise. Knows him. So, so this is the operation. What is the issue? The issue is the British Empire. Now, it's not a British Empire. It's, it's British in the sense of nominally. It's also Saudi. It's, all, it's also Dutch. The genesis of this empire system is Dutch. And it came because the Dutch, in their war against the Spaniards, you may recall that, the Dutch became the winners. The Dutch became the pestilence against France and other things. And then they moved across from the 17th century. They moved across and invaded. They were the first ones who suppressed the American colonization in Massachusetts, 1660. And they have always been the curse. We had to fight against. This is our enemy. But the British Empire is our enemy, but it's really the Dutch Empire. And the Saudis are nothing but an offshoot of this whole thing. And therefore, because of the power that this combination represents in the world, the fact that they ran the drug operation against China, that they did a similar operation against India, what they do against all these countries of that region is a reign of terror. And only if the United States because it's in our character to deal with things like this. If only if the United States intervenes and says, this ends, this ends. And if the United States does honor by its own victims, the victims of New York City, for example, only if we act to correct this error will we find ourselves equipped with the stamina and insight necessary to deal with the British Empire problem. Well, because I can't resist and because we still have time, one last question. And this is on the uh, advent of the disintegration of the British Commonwealth. This week, we received the happy news that the Republic of Gambia has become the latest country to declare independence from the British Empire. On Wednesday, the government of Gambia announced that it was withdrawing its membership from the British Commonwealth. They said, Gambia will never be a member of any neo-colonial institution and never be a party to any institution that represents an extension of colonialism. And this announcement comes conveniently just six weeks before the great global convention of the Commonwealth, which usually has 53 member states, However, this year it will only have 52. And as you made the point last Friday, the poor queen is suffering some ailments at this time. And the British royal family is in a major crisis, as well as poor Prince Charles, I mean Prince Philip, her royal consort. And um, you have that on one hand, countries like Gambia declaring independence. You also mentioned Scotland last week. So my question is, my final question is, what can be done to hasten this disintegration of the British Empire? We don't really need to do much directly in that way. All you have to do, let's say, let's take two nations. Let's take the United States, China, Russia probably, so forth, and a few nations that have the guts to challenge this process will be sufficient. Because what, what's the situation throughout Europe, the nations of Europe? Every nation in Europe is in desperation now. now. They, have no, they have no power of their own to survive. They're trying to survive, but it's a losing battle. So therefore, if we and China and a few other countries decide to challenge this thing and say an end to this, then that, in that way, we could regain our sovereignty. And if we did, 
some wonderful things would begin to happen. Good. Okay. Well, with that to look forward to, I will bring a conclusion to tonight's uh, broadcast. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Ben. And thank you all for watching. Good night.